But I've tried to keep the focus of today's talk mainly on sort of what can you do today to help your business onboard itself onto AI. If you fast forward five or 10 or 20 years, it's kind of impossible to say where we're all gonna be with this, whether the world will be a better place or a worse place or what. It all kind of gets quite philosophical. But today I'm focusing on sort of the here and now. I'm gonna start with a bit of history. I'm gonna talk about generative AI, talk about some of the tools that are available, um, how you can onboard your business onto it. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the risks and also how we might use ChatGPT to perhaps solve some of the challenges that are faced specifically by Guernsey businesses. So, a brief history. Alan Turing, famous computing pioneer, miles ahead of his time. In 1950, he wrote a paper proposing the question, can, ma can machines think? And in this paper, he proposed the famous Turing test, which is a test of sort of human level intelligence in a computer. The idea is you have um, someone sat at a computer terminal chatting to two different things. What, one chat is going on with a human, the other one is going on with a computer. The question is, can this person determine which is the human and which is the computer? Some people would say we've already achieved that with, with chat GPT. Um, so yeah, very famous test. 1956, the famous Dartmouth conference um, a lot of incredibly powerful minds, uh, scientists, came together to talk about um, intelligence in computing, and they coined the term artificial intelligence. 1965, ELISA, developed by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT, was the first chatbot. Um, and it actually, uh, believe it or not, it was able to actually converse with humans at a very basic level. Um, between then and 1997, there was some investment. There was, there was a bit of an AI winter as well, um, where the promises didn't really fulfill. Um, the, the researchers weren't able to fulfill their promises. Investment dried up. Then it all sort of kicked off again. Um, and IBM's Deep Blue famously beat Gary Kasparov um, in uh, under chess tournament conditions. The topic of many, many books and films um, and a very impressive achievement, a real milestone in AI. Fast forward to 2017, AI beat the world number one Go player, KeyG, which was a huge milestone. Go is a much more complicated game than chess. There are billions more states that the board can be in. Um, the amazing thing about Google's AlphaGo was that it taught itself how to play. All they did was they fed in the basic rules of Go. It then played itself many millions of times got better and better, and by the end of it, it was demonstrating um, Go strategies that were completely new um, to these experienced Go players, and it has actually influenced the way people play Go till today. And actually, Google's um, AlphaGo is still rated as the number one Go player in the world. Um, so 2018, OpenAI actually, Open AI actually launched their first version of GPT, the story behind this is there was a researcher at OpenAI who was playing around with Amazon reviews, and he was writing, building a model, training a model to take half an Amazon review and predict what the next letter would be in the Amazon review. During this process, he realized that the model that he'd built was able to detect the temperature of those reviews. Was it a positive review? Was it a bad review? And this was a feature that OpenAI had no idea it was able to do. They just kind of discovered it. And at that point, they quickly realized that they were onto something. The concept of a large language model was created. Um, they trained the GPT-1 on a, a large corpus of books and websites, um, and that started their journey into it. Fast forward to 2022, GPT was up to version 3.5, and they launched it to the general public. They genuinely had no idea how transformative it was going to be. They released it on the basis that they could do with a few more people testing it and giving them some feedback. It, it reached one million users in five days and now is approaching one billion users a month. And if you compare this to some of the other sort of major platforms out there, Instagram maybe took a couple of months to reach a million users. Chat GPT five days, that's how transformative and how insane the growth has been. 
Um, so generative AI. AI has been around for, for years, for the last sort of 10, 15 years. It's been used a lot in industry. The AI sort of used largely up until the end of 2022 was based around um, sort of predicting data. So it would take a huge data set. You train it on that data set, say a load of weather information, and then it could use, use new inputs to predict what the outputs might be. Generative AI is different. It creates things at a very simple level. So for example, you can put text in and it will give you text out. So I use this notation kind of throughout the presentation, text to text. So for example, you can ask it a question and it will give you an answer. So I'm going to do a few examples of using ChatGPT um, of text to text. Um, and you can see I'm using this format throughout as well. So on the left, I've got my prompt. And on the right, we're going to see what the output from the generative AI tool is. And on the top right, you can see I've got the, the ChatGPT logo there. So the first thing, write me a short story about a unicorn. So this is what it gave me in about five seconds. Under a silken moon, a solitary unicorn roamed the midnight meadow, its horn shimmering with celestial luminescence. It discovered a wounded sparrow, its wing broken. In a glimmer of magic, the unicorn touched its horn to the bird, mending it. In gratitude, the sparrow sang the world's most beautiful song. I mean, it's poetic. It's quite amazing, really. Um, a human could write that. You know, uh, a human who has good writing skills, maybe in a couple of hours. Um, but when I first started using ChatGPT and I realized I could do things like this, my mind was absolutely blown. Let's try another one. Describe Guernsey, where the first letter of each word spells out Guernsey. Gorgeous, unspoiled environments, radiant nature, seascape exudes year-round serenity. Again, quite amazing. Um, a human might, might be able to do that in a couple of hours and might not be so eloquent. Um, but ChatGPT has got all these amazing capabilities to sort of play word games and things like that as well. Okay, something a bit more practical. Draft me an indemnity clause. Party A, the indemnifier, hereby agrees to hold harmless, defend and indemnify, etc., etc. This would probably cost you a few hundred pounds to get a lawyer to draw up. Um, an example, I can imagine seeing that, suddenly all of you are thinking, okay, this can be quite, potentially quite useful. Write me a letter of complaint to the planning authority about the new golf nets at the, <laughs> golf nets at the Grand Mar. <laughs> and it does, I won't read it out to you, but it's done quite, quite a good job. I'll just think about this. Anyone, a resident, you know, your typical resident around the Varsland area, probably wouldn't have enough budget to um, engage a lawyer to write a legalese-style letter, yet ChatGPT has done this for you. you know, it's democratizing access to this level of um, writing. I'm going to provide a load more GPT examples throughout the presentation as well, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about text-to-image now. And I'm going to use Midjourney for this. Midjourney is one of the, I've played around with loads of different image generation tools, but I found Midjourney to be the most powerful. Unfortunately, it's not massively accessible. It's quite difficult to use. Um, so let's say, ask it for an image of Alan Turing on a laptop. He tragically died many, many years before, some, before his ideas became to fruition. Um, but Midjourney gave me this which is quite mind-blowing. It's a he quite heavily stylized photo of Alan Turing on a laptop. Boris Johnson at a party. Let's have a look at that. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> if you just think about this for a minute, that photo was never taken. This was created for me in response to that prompt. It's the only version of the photo that exists. It will never be created again. It's completely generated off the, off the cuff by mid-journey. Clay model head of a man screaming. Look at that. Colorful oil painting of a seagull on a rock. Amazing. How about if we feed in the description of a unicorn that I generated earlier? OK, it looks pretty good. The only thing is it doesn't have a sparrow in it. I tried quite a few times to get a version with a sparrow in, but it didn't seem to want to pick up on that, pick up on that but it's done a, a reasonably good job. How about something a bit more practical? A UI design for a sports retailer e-commerce site. 
So that's pretty impressive. You'll find that these image generators don't really get text. They don't really write text properly, and it normally comes up with quite strange sort of characters there. But the concept is pretty impressive. If you're a designer and you're hitting a bit of creative block, um, ChatGPT, or sorry, not ChatGPT, MidJourney will actually create some really interesting layouts for you to sort of help you on that journey. UI design, going to society for the prevention of cruelty to animals. Let's see what comes up for that. A nice little mobile design there. Um, when I saw that Steve was presenting, I thought I'd throw something into the GSPCA as well. Again, you can see that the words aren't really words, but the, the UI is, is pretty nice there. How about some product design? Packaging design for a new beer. So it came up with that in about a minute, which is pretty beautiful. I'd drink that beer. Uh, packaging design for a new watch. That looks very nice, doesn't it? It's definitely some Swiss vibes. And it's actually got the, the numbers correct on the watch face as well. And again, this is uh, created for me in about a minute. It's the only version of this image that exists. Um, let's go for, so you're designing, you're creating a brochure, you're struggling with some imagery. Let's just ask it for an abstract image representing integrity and trustworthiness. A couple of values that appear on most companies' corporate, corporate image. Something like that. I feature quite nicely on the cover of a brochure. Okay, I'm going to do some image to image um, ones now. Again, using mid-journey. Mid so mid-journey will actually merge images together pretty well. So here I've got a photo of a hamster and Homer Simpson, and it makes a little Homer Simpson hamster. It looks like a photo of a, ha a yellow hamster <laughs> with, a, with a white T-shirt on. Let's try a photo of a hamster and uh, a dragon destroying a landscape. Okay, that's pretty good, isn't it? It's even got the fire in the background, a slightly creepy uh, hamster. What about me and a hamster? Oh, that's just creepy, isn't it? <laughs> Very creepy. What about Boris Johnson and a hamster? Oh, this is my favorite. <laughs> we could also do three images together. So you've got a hamster, Boris Johnson, and a dragon. And it's come up with this kind of warped sort of vision of a nightmarish sort of uh, scenario. Um, but yeah, quite, still quite impressive. And there's others, text to video, text to code, video to video. You can take two videos and merge them together. You can take a video of one thing in an image and say remake the video in, in using this style of this image. Text to audio, um, with, there's a ChatGPT plugin that will actually take the response from ChatGPT and read it back to you in the form of a visual avatar which is quite amazing. Text to music. There are radio stations out there that play 24-7 AI-generated music in real time without a break. And the number of tools out there to use all of this stuff is absolutely insane. The ecosystem of AI tools that has exploded in the last few months is mad. There's millions, billions worth of investment going into it. And if I'm honest, it's a bit of a bubble. There's hundreds of new tools coming out each week, and only a small handful of them are actually going to kind of come out at the, at the back of it. You know, the three big ones are almost certainly going to be there. So you've got OpenAI with ChatGPT and DALI2, which is their image generation software. You've got Microsoft have launched their Bing Chat, which is still in beta, which is effectively a repackaged and slightly differently trained version of GPT. And then they're also launching Copilot, which is uh, a large language model integration with uh, Microsoft Office Suite. You've got Google's Bard, which is currently only available in the States, but you've, if you can spin up a US VPN, you can play around with their version, which apparently is much better at coding than uh, ChatGPT. And they're also integrating their own large language model into their Google Workspace Suite in the form of Duet AI as well. So that will help you to create presentations and documents and policies and procedures and things. Um, and actually, if you think about it, Imad Mostak, who's the owner of, or the founder of Stability AI, and they're one of the only open source AI providers, 
he recently said, it has become possible to imagine an AI-generated new season of Game of Thrones. If you think about the level of production that goes into that, um, a year ago, if someone said that, people would look at you in a strange way and think that's just completely and absolutely bonkers. But I read that now and I think, okay, yeah, there's some tools out there that are sort of heading in that direction. And it's, it's quite mad. So why is this all relevant to um, businesses in Guernsey? Well, let's focus on ChatGPT. This is kind of the, the main, the most accessible tool at the moment. Um, firstly, your staff will be using ChatGPT, probably, whether you like it or not, and it comes with risks. So you need to make sure your staff are aware of those risks and they're using ChatGPT in, a, in, in the proper way. Your competitors will be using ChatGPT to become more productive. Your suppliers will be using ChatGPT to negotiate more persuasively. Nefarious people will be using ChatGPT to supercharge their hacking campaigns. And uh, as I mentioned in the slide just now, a version of ChatGPT will be appearing in Office 365 um, under the name of Copilot imminently. And so whether you like it or not, all your staff are just going to have this stuff appear in their Office 365 suite at some point. So what are the risks? Firstly, data security and privacy. Anything you put into ChatGPT is hoovered up into OpenAI systems um, in San Francisco. It goes straight out of Europe. By default, they'll use that to further train their models and kind of do whatever they like with it. And if I'm honest, the data protection controls aren't really great. So the number one rule is don't put any personal data into ChatGPT at all. Um, accuracy and misinformation. So ChatGPT is trained up until the end of 2021. It doesn't know anything about any events that have happened since then. So if you ask it about the Ukraine war, it will talk about the annexation of Crimea in 2014, but it, it won't really go much further than that. Similarly, Matt, you talked about hallucination. The free version of ChatGPT is pretty bad. It will hallucinate about 40% of the time, and it will make stuff up willingly, but in a very eloquent and well-written and convincing way. There was a story that I shared on LinkedIn recently about a lawyer who was representing a client who got injured by a, a trolley in an aeroplane, and he used ChatGPT to research into uh, previous cases as part of the, the file that he was providing to the court. GPT gave him a dozen cases that all set the, the right precedent. And um, the court started looking into these. They couldn't find any examples of these cases. And ChatGPT had hallucinated all of them. Um, this story hit the news, and obviously the lawyer was highly embarrassed. But it's an example of an employee using ChatGPT to find these incredible productivity benefits, but not really understanding its limitations and causing great embarrassment. Bias. So these large language models are trained on sort of a huge corpus of, of information and copy across Wikipedia, across the internet, millions and millions of books that humans have written over hundreds of years. All of those books all of that copy has bias built into it. It's got racial bias built into it. It's got gender bias built into it. And that is reflected in some of the out outcomes of using these large language models. Um, so you need to be careful, for example, if you're using it for advice on hiring or something like that. Copyright uh, is, a, is a, an important consideration, more so on the image generation side. Midjourney, the tool I, was, I used to generate these images before, is actually facing quite a few large um, legal cases from companies like Getty. Um, Getty were actually using Midjourney, and, and Midjourney produced an image that had a Getty watermark on it. Um, and obviously, Getty weren't, weren't very happy about that. So there's this big question over whether these image generators actually violate copyright law. And for that reason, as an agency, whilst we're playing around with them a lot, we don't really use, you know, we're not using the images for our clients yet because we just don't know what, what the copyright ramifications are. It's more difficult, it's, the, it's more nuanced with the large language models like ChatGPT, um, but it's still a concern. You've got over-dependency, and this is something that 
will probably develop over the next sort of couple of years as people start using large language models more and more. If your company becomes over-dependent on ChatGPT and starts to become lazy, that will stifle your creative output and your critical thinking, and that that's, can't be a good thing for, for any business, really. Um, so how can I stay ahead as a business? So the first thing is to identify. So go out there. What AI tools are there that are accessible and easy to use that are going to benefit my business? The core one is a large language model like ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or Google's Bard. Um, if you've got access to those, one of those will probably form the central pillar of how you're going to use generative AI in your business. But then every industry, there's about 10 tools that offer AI, generative AI services to specific to your industry, whether you're an architect or a lawyer or whatever. There's loads of tools out there. And so the first job is to just find out what these tools are, how can they help you. The next is to integrate. So figure out how you're going to use these tools. Is there any software integration that needs to happen? How much do you need to pay for them? You'll need to write an AI policy that will sit alongside your data protection policy and your IT security policy. It's that important. And this AI policy will outline the tools that you're going to use, what they're useful for, what they're not useful for, um, outline the security measures, just get it all lined up and ready to go. The next thing is to train your staff on using these tools. That will involve briefing the AI policy into them, making sure they understand it. Training them on prompt design, which is going to become a huge buzzword over the next couple of years, because writing your prompt is an art form in itself to get the best out of the generative AI that you're using. And then monitor it. Try and set some KPIs. Try and monitor your staff's productivity um, number of jobs they're getting done in a specific time frame, how much, um, how much revenue you're billing, and some more qualitative stuff, such as speaking to the staff and getting their feedback on how it's working, and then feeding that back in to continually evolve and improve, the, evolve and improve your setup. Now, this process is pretty much the same for any rollout of any IT system, and it's no different, really, for AI. The difference with AI is the monitor and improvement step. You need to run it much more frequently because the, the ecosystem of AI tools at the moment is just evolving so, so insanely quickly that you just need to keep, keep on top of it. Now, this makes the really easy to remember acronym ITME. Um, let's be honest, it's not that easy to remember, is it? Shall we use ChatGPT to try and find a better acronym? Okay, so rename these five steps so that the acronym is a, is a meaningful word. Identify, integrate, train, monitor, improve. Okay, let's come up with teach. Target, equip, acquaint, check, and hoe, which I like, but the words are a little bit, you know, it feels like it's stretching things a little bit. And I also like the, the fact that it starts with identify. So I've asked it to do the same again, but keep the first word as identify. Let's come up with ideas. Identify, deploy, educate, assess, and streamline. And that's, uh, I'm quite happy with that, so that's what we're going to roll with. Ideas. <laughs> um, okay. So what about Guernsey specifically? I asked Alice from Chamber about the, the most common challenges faced by its members in Guernsey, and many of you will probably recognize the things on this list. So we've got staff issues, lack of key skills and increasing wages. We've got inflation, infrastructure, connectivity, open banking, limited payment providers and slow bank account setup, and retail competition from inline. So I've plucked a couple of these out, and I've thought about how we could use GPT to solve this problem. So the first thing I thought, let's write a letter to, let's write a letter to Putin to ask him to stop the war in Ukraine. And it's done it. Um, you know, I'd have sent this letter to him, and maybe he will take, take note and stop the war. But even if he did, inflation would still be there. It's not going to stop overnight. So the next thing is, as a business, how do you tackle inflation? The only thing you can really do is put your own prices up. If you're at the pointy end of it, you ask an economist, should I do that? They'll say no, because that'll perpetuate inflation. But you're running a small business, you've got you have a payroll to, to reach. Um, you've got to put your prices up. So I run a digital agency. Uh, why don't I ask ChatGPT to ask it to 
ask my loyal clients, help me write a letter to ask my loyal clients, informing them that in the face of high inflation, we need to increase our rates. And it's come up with a very eloquent, um, writ eloquently written letter that will achieve that goal. Now, I've still got to summon the courage to send that out. <laughs> um, but it's taken the sting out of the tail of that exercise, you know. Okay, how about one of the clients comes back to me and says, they can't afford the increase. They're struggling anyway. How can I respond to that? Let's ask ChatGPT. And it's come back with a, another very eloquently written email with a few ideas. I've cut it off at the bottom there because it's quite long. But it's effectively starting to help me negotiate um, very well with my clients to try and find a good outcome that works for both parties. So actually in the context of negotiation, it's really powerful. How about the problem of open banking? Stripe is an incredibly powerful payment provider. I work in digital, we build websites. If I could roll out Stripe for our going to clients, I'd be incredibly happy because their API is amazing. Um, they support payments from Alipay, so they can, they can trade in China, China, just an incredible platform. But they don't support Guernsey, and that's a bit of a headache for the Guernsey businesses. So let's feed this into ChatGPT and see if it can help us persuade Stripe to provide services to Guernsey. This is what it came back with. I won't read it all, but it's given us a sort of seven-step plan. So the first is research, understand why they might not be able to operate in Guernsey, what are their reasons write a business case for them, explain the regulatory landscape to them, form a local partnership with a few businesses to perhaps help them through that process, start up a petition or a campaign, reach out to them directly with your business case and all this information, and then stay persistent. So we've got the, the bones of kind of a campaign here. All right, let's dive a little bit deeper. Help me flesh out the social media campaign. Right, so it's done a pretty good job here of um, putting together a sort of 10-step social media strategy. The guys at the back will have no chance of reading this, so I'll, I'll just give you a high-level overview. So you've got your campaign name, your objectives, what platforms are you going to, to roll it out on, what's the content strategy for this social media campaign, what hashtags are you going to use. We should start a petition online and try and get people to sign it. Let's engage some influencers, um, keep updates firing through regularly to keep people engaged, um, engaged directly with Stripe through social media, and then kind of continue to evaluate and analyze it. Now, as a digital agency that regularly runs di social media campaigns for our clients, that's pretty good. That's, you know, if someone came to us with a similar brief, we'd do something very much like that, except this took about five seconds and we'd take a couple of days. Um, okay, can you write me a LinkedIn post to kick off the campaign and gather some gather some uh, support, and include some emojis, please. So it's written this. I won't read it, I won't read it out and bore you all, but it's, uh, you can see it's a kind of LinkedIn post that you might put out to launch the campaign and start to gather some support from local businesses. Okay, create me a social media calendar. So I've, it's given me a social media post every day for the first, it gave me four weeks actually, I've only included the first two weeks. But you've got week one, awareness and introduction. You've got a LinkedIn post, day two, Facebook, Twitter, day three, Instagram, with topics against each of them. Week two, engagement and information. Keep on with that post. So how about, okay, so it's starting to actually plan out this whole campaign for us. Write me the content for the first week's posts. There you go. So it's taken all of those posts. It started with our LinkedIn post. It's written it out for me. Uh, the day two post there, and it's actually given me all, all the posts for the first week there, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, GPT has basically planned out this whole social media campaign, and all I need to do is just turn up, log into my social media platforms, and just copy and paste it in, and off I go. Um, so, you know, it's, I think with these large language models, they're not going to be a kind of automatic solution to these major problems we've got but they will certainly oil the cogs in finding a solution. Um, how about staff? A really difficult one. Um, you know, I thought about this, and the, there's no obvious solution to, there's no easy solution to plugging the, the resource gaps in Guernsey and plugging the 
inflationary pressures which are pushing up salaries um, sometimes at an unsustainable rate. So I asked um, GPT, how can I make my business a more attractive place to work without increasing salary bands? And it's come up with a, a few really useful outputs here again. Um, the, the copy is quite small, but I did want to paste the whole thing in just to, just to show you what it's produced. But I'll read out the points. You've got flexible work arrangements, professional development opportunities, positive work environment, health and wellness initiatives, additional benefits, career progression, purpose and values, um, all really great ways to try and differentiate yourself without basically buying um, staff. What you could also do with GPT is you could take your staff handbook, um, as long as there's no confidential information in it, many companies put their handbook on their website, just stick that into GPT and ask GPT for its feedback on it. What are the gaps? Where, what could I do better here? And it will create a short list of things that you can do to make, make you stand out. Let's dive a bit deeper. Tell me more about health and wellness initiatives. Okay, so we could look at rolling out some fitness programs. We could roll out some mental health resources for our staff. Healthy eating initiatives. Um, how about an ergonomics review to make sure everyone's work environment is in, is in a healthy place? Promoting preventative health care, wellness education, flexible work schedules, and support for personal issues. Um, so this is all stuff that, as a business, you could sort of spend a good amount of time rolling out to just try and get ahead of the, of, of the other firms that are competing for that small, the small numbers of, of, of staff that are out there. And it actually goes on. It listed about 20 ideas there. Um, okay, so how about we need to find the new compliance officer? Um, I, know, I know that's quite a hard position to fill at the moment. Um, can you help me build a social media campaign around these values? Okay. Week one, introduce the campaign in the job role, and it's very similar to what it did for the Stripe campaign. You've got five... Five social media posts there um, for week one. You've got week two, highlight your values, another five posts, and it goes through week by week. I can guarantee you that's probably 10 times more promotion than any other business that's looking for staff is probably doing right now. And if you can align that with some sort of carefully honed improvements to your, your work environment, then you're going to um, have a good chance of finding those staff. Obviously, you'll need to continue paying them competitively, but you won't have to pay them over and above what other firms are offering in order to, to bring them on board. Um, so, where do I start? Those are just some examples. It's really just scratching the surface of what, what Gen, a, Gen AI can do for businesses. So, where do I start? The first is just, if you haven't already joined ChatGPT, if you haven't already started using it, just go to ChatGPT chats.openai.com and just register and start using it. It's free. It's really easy to use. It's really accessible. Just start using it. And if, if, if you find it useful, and I'd, I'd be surprised if you don't, then I'd recommend signing up for the $20 a month plus, plus package because that will give you access to GPT-4, which hallucinates significantly less and is an order of magnitude better at the kind of things that I've been demonstrating to you today. Perplexity AI um, is actually based on the GPT API, but it infuses GPT with up-to-date information. Um, Perplexity AI is more of, a, more of a classic kind of search engine interface where you, you type a query and it gives you, it will give you a summary. It will write you a short essay about your answer, containing your answer, but it will actually reference real posts across the web. Um, which is really useful for research and double-checking whether it's hallucinating or not, because you can actually look at where it's got the information from and back up, back up its findings. Between these two, I basically don't use Google anymore. I just use ChatGPT and, and Perplexity, which is nice, because neither of them have any advertising. Um, in terms of image generation, I use MidJourney throughout this presentation because it's, I've found it to be the most powerful but it's really difficult to use. It's not very accessible. Um, so I've recommended Stable Diffusion here if you want to play around with an image generator because you can just go onto their website, enter a prompt, and it will just start generating images for you. 
Um, and it is, it is pretty good, stable diffusion. Um, but in terms of your day-to-day -day businesses, I ex I'd expect between ChatGPT and Perplexity, you'll be able to find some really amazing productivity improvements. Um, and that's it. So hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed all of that, and I'm happy to take any questions if you've got any. I uh, just wondered, what, what's the sort of volume that people are using it for at the moment? Is it, are there trends in, you know, the main areas that it's being used? Um, so advertising obviously seems like the obvious one, but um, are, there, are there other areas like saving the planet, environmental, things like that? Or um, Well, I know I can speak for the digital industry because I run a digital agency, and I know across the digital industry programmers in particular are all over it and I know my team are saving hours and hours and hours a week using it to help with help with coding challenges and, and troubleshooting issues. Um, I know the, the legal industry is all over it I think primarily because it's, a, it's quite presents quite in theory quite a big threat to knowledge industries um, and legal industries in particular um, a lot of our sort of legal clients are kind of all over it and using it quite heavily and training their own models to do various things as well. Um, I, I don't have any immediate statistics around like wider industries, but um, I, I suspect that a lot of them are using it rather he quite heavily. And if you know, if not now, then imminently it will be yeah, heavily used. Um, what about getting legal opinion from it? Um, as you say, there's a lawyer fallen foul of it, and how does it relate to Guernsey law as opposed to international or British law? Um, so it's it's very good at sort of general advice, if you like. Um, when it comes to the nuances of Guernsey law, then I mean you should never rely on it completely anyway. Um, you can use it by all means paste the legal documents into it and start asking it questions and it will do a good job at responding to those questions and maybe give you a feel for what um, you know, the, the, the topic of the document. But if you're making any big decisions off of that, I'd definitely get some additional legal advice on top of that um, because you shouldn't sort of completely rely on it in that respect. Um, in terms of the nuances of Guernsey law and the nuances of, say, setting up like a trust in Guernsey or something like that, it's some way off from that because it is so general. Um, I suspect that over time we'll start to see firms rolling out models that are specifically trained on the law in certain jurisdictions, say BVI or Cayman or Guernsey, that are experts in those jurisdictions that can, can answer a lot of questions confidently. But I think the thing about law is there's always accountability. Um, you can't as a law firm, you can sort of potentially um, use these tools to help your lawyers, but at the end of the day, a lawyer has to sign off for it and take accountability if it's wrong. So I think there will always be human lawyers there. Um, and my view is that in law and in, in digital and a lot of these industries, I think, at least in the short term, AI will just turbocharge productivity rather than, um, rather than replace jobs. You spoke a little bit about the limitations of ChatGPT in particular's training set. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. And you said it went up to 2021. And I don't know if, uh, and you spoke just now about the limitations of, say, regional specific kind of law or, or limitations that it might have. Can you talk a little bit about the, the why? And do you know what the evolutions of those training sets might be? Is it because of risk or is it because of commercial kind of opportunities for people to build their own on their own training sets that? are causing OpenAI to limit its access to the current uh, internet? And will that change as ChatGPT evolves? Um, I think there's various reasons for the current training set, mainly because they've had to spend a huge amount of resource collating this data together into a format that can be used to train an AI. And so, and they sort of completed that at the end of 2021, and they used that to build sort of GPT 3.5, and then they used the same training set to, to, to train GPT 4, which was trained on the same data set, but just kind of an order of magnitude more powerful and trained in a slightly different way, and so the results were much better. I think 
it's impossible to say. I don't think OpenAI have sort of made any public statements about whether they'll expand that data set to be more recent, but I wouldn't be surprised if when GPT-5 arrives that it'll be trained on data that's a bit more recent. But you've also got to remember that with Gen AI, the amount of content on the web that is AI generated is going to explode. Um, so there's this kind of cutoff on the web where, you know, sort of pre-2022, all of the content or the vast majority of it will have actually been written by humans. And post-2022, we'll get to a point where the vast amount of content is actually produced by AI. And then what happens when you take that AI content and feed it back into a model to train more AI, it's, it's going to be like a bit incestual, isn't it? And you'll start to sort of get some potentially some strange results coming out of it. And I think that's probably another thing they're battling with. But it is, it's a major drawback of uh, GPT is the fact that it's trained up to 2021. Microsoft's model um, and Google's BARD actually answers more recent questions in sort of uh, more meaningful ways. So they've, they've taken their sort of GPT model and trained it a bit further um, on more recent updates to, to give that, that additional functionality. But yeah, in all honesty, I don't think that the limit of 2021 will be a limit for very long. I think it's just the way they've built it to date. John? Yes, I've sat on the legislation committees in Guernsey for many years, and one of the things that Guernsey decided was that both an income earner and a good industry was intellectual property, even image property. Now, how, how much that has done, I don't know. I always had a certain scepticism about uh, how you could protect images in e e every sense. But well, from what you were saying about Getty, this surely is a, is, a, is, a, is a potential weakness, especially for the islands, of this technology, because the technology seems to suck in <laughs> ideas from elsewhere. Yeah, it does, yeah. And actually, copyright in AI is, is a real challenge. I mean, if you think about image-based, think, think about the image generation, right? What, imagine if you sort of walked into a, a gallery of Banksy images and you sort of wandered around and you took it all in and then you were inspired by Banksy to create your own piece of art that looked like a Banksy. That piece of art would be owned by you, that would be your copyright, Banksy would have no claim to that. That's kind of what these AI models are doing, they're being inspired by these, by these um, images and creating them, but the difference is that there's a big firm at the top that's potentially making huge amounts of money out of it. So yeah, it's a kind of a difficult area. The last week the um, EU sort of passed a draft of the EU AI Act, which, it, which is a, a piece of regulation that will govern how AI is rolled out across Europe. And part of that is that um, <clears throat> as part of your release, you have to provide information on what, your, what content your AI was used to train. Sorry, what, what content you used to train your AI from a copyright perspective. So they've kind of built copyright into that. Um, how they'll do that? I don't know because, I mean, with Midjourney, they basically just sent a crawl around the internet and it just hoovered up all the images and trained itself on them. Um, so that I think that with this EU Act, which will probably come into force towards the end of 2024, I think a lot of these Gen AI firms will start to get their act together in terms of properly handling copyright um, and also other things like bias um, and all the, you know, some of the other issues that have been raised. Uh, in, in the recent news about the dangers of AI. Hi. Blockchain technology is another disruptive technology that's emerged in the last 10 years. How do you see potentially AI weaving in with blockchain and what are the end results there? Um, I don't really, I know sort of a little bit about blockchain, but I'm not completely sort of, dealt, I don't really have a huge understanding of that topic. So I haven't really got a clear answer for you on that one. Sorry about that. Could probably fudge something, but <laughs> I don't want to do that. You can ask ChatGPT. <laughs> you can ask ChatGPT, yeah. It'll give a better answer than me. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm looking forward to the Chamber of Commerce lunch in five years' time when two of us are sitting here. Um, <laughs> 
One question was about our government, really. Um, do you, have you spoken to our government about this and do you aware of what their plan is and uh, what the strategy is going forward? Um, are they all over it? Uh, what's happening behind the scenes? Do you know? Um, I know they're looking at it. Um, I'm, in, I'm in discussion with um, someone from the States at the moment and they're sort of asking me what, um, what I've been looking into and whether there's any focus groups that, that I've been part of. Um, and so, yeah, they, they are looking at it, but I haven't really managed to get very far with them yet. But uh, it's, it's got to be, it is on their radar. I can't really provide any more information than that at the moment. So. Thanks. I just wondered if you, um, if you were aware of any AI detection software. So obviously you can put a question into GBT and get an answer. Is there software that works the other way around, so it detects plagiarism in a document? Um, probably. Um, I'm not sure of any off the top of my head. There is a tool called Zero GPT, which um, can, in theory, detect whether a piece of copy was written by AI, mm. which is potentially quite useful in education um, for detecting students that are using GPT to write their essays. Um, I've used it and with, with some with, you know, with limited success, kind of 70% of the time it has a good guess, you know, kind of gets it right, but a lot of the time it will either say something is AI generated when it's not, or it will say something isn't AI generated when it is. Um, but yeah, that's probably the, a tool worth playing around with initially. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. So I think in the absence of any more questions, we'll call it there. Thank you. Just ask you to give Pat a big round of applause.